Hello, hello. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us at our fifth annual Iron Sharpens Iron event. Needless to say, I wish we were doing this in person. We'd be right here at Giant, Giant Stadium enjoying a live event, enjoying a live baseball game. But in COVID fashion, we're doing it virtually. Typically, we, this would be an intimate event, really designed for our GPs, our founders, and our CEOs. But this year, we decided to open it up. And guess what? We've had over 500 people register to join us. So thank you all for being with us this evening. Um, you know, we're gonna have a lot of fun. I know that you are out here and joining us because of our two panelists and we're gonna definitely spend some time picking their brains and getting a better sense of who they are and their journey to the top of the mountain. But for those that don't know who I am, I'm Ryan Neese, the founder and managing partner of Next Play Capital. We designed Next Play Capital with one simple mission. We wanted to find a way to give our community the opportunity to invest with and alongside the best venture funds and companies. And guess what? Over the last six years, we've invested up close to $200 million in some amazing VCs, Excel, Greylock, IVP, First Round, Union Square, and a laundry list of other firms that we're so grateful and honored to be an LP. And at the same time, we've also had the opportunity to invest in some exciting companies that are game changing like Peloton, Impossible Foods, Bite Dance, Hymns, Flexport, and a number of other great companies that are literally changing the world. We can't do this alone. I can't do this alone. And I have a team that's out there. So Aaron, Eric, John, Hunter, Kaylee, thank you for all your support over the years. Thank you for helping us build a phenomenal firm that's truly making a difference and living up to our mission. But I also want to just take a moment and, and just say, Aaron, for you, thank you so much. Many of you have worked with Aaron over the years. She's been in charge of a lot of our events, has communicated with you directly, has worked side by side with me. This is her last event and we couldn't be excited for her as she's getting ready to move on to another position at another firm. So Aaron, from the bottom of my heart and the rest of the team, thank you so much for all that you've done. You know, as we think about what we've been able to do, it's not just the team, it's also the individuals that have come around us. It's our service providers. And we've assembled a great group of service providers that are supporting us here tonight as well. We think about Aduro and Anderson Tax and Frank Rimmerman and Mofo and, and Brex, and without a doubt, Harmony Capital. Uh, Rob Dean, you've been with us since the beginning as well. I know you're probably out there in Hawaii right now, so aloha to you. Thank you for your support and thank you to the Giants for continuing to be behind us as we continue our mission. You know, like I said, when I think about what we're striving to do at, at Next Play, it's this idea of pursuing excellence. Internally, we're constantly talking about that and how we continue to improve as a firm and all, up, all, all across the board. But at the same time, for us to do that, we wanna get around others that are elite at what they do, learn from them, pick their brains, and you know what? That's why we started Iron Sharpen Iron Sharpens Iron. This is a unique way for us to get inside the minds of men and women that have achieved the highest level in their careers. And no doubt tonight, we have a phenomenal lineup. We have two panelists that I'm so fired up that I consider friends, but I have tremendous respect for. The first up is Julia Hartz, the co-founder and current CEO of Eventbrite. Really, she's responsible for the vision of the company, the strategy and the growth. And many of you know that this has been a global company, no doubt under her leadership, not only have they continued to expand around the globe, but Julia's prided herself and been honored and awarded for the culture she's created inside the company. It says a lot about the leader to be able to lead a phenomenal company, but create a culture that's dominating as well. Eventbrite has won multiple awards for their workplace culture. Julia herself, is a female founders, Forbes 100, the Fortune 40 under 40. She's an like Inc's 35 and under uh, most powerful women and most powerful entrepreneurs. But more importantly, she is a proud member of the 2018 Henry Crown Fellows class. The Too Legit class gives you some love, Julia. Thank you for joining us tonight. We're, we're so glad you could be with us. Thank you so much for having me. It's so good to see you and be in this virtual ball ballpark together. I'm so proud of you, Ryan. Yeah, this is exciting. I love this background and, and uh, I can't, I'm so glad you're here. You know, we got to bring in our other panelists because I know you're, you're going to enjoy speaking with him as well. 
And up next is Cedric the Entertainer, a man of many talents. He's an actor, he's a comedian, he's a game show host, he's a car collector, he's hosted BET's Comic View, he's hosted Def Jam. Many of us know him and remember him from the original Kings of Comedy, and definitely his role as Eddie Walker in Barbershop. He also was the host of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? He's done a ton of voiceovers, Ice Age, Madagascar. That's where the money comes in because those things go all over the place. He is the best. And right now, he's currently starring on the hit show on CBS called The Neighborhood. Last year, he was honored for all of his hard work, for all the things he's been able to accomplish throughout his entire career in Hollywood and received the star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Cedric, thank you so much for being with us tonight. We're so grateful you could be here. He's coming on in a second. He's just making you sweat, Ryan. Yeah, no doubt. Absolutely. I like that. Well, as I think about said getting ready to come on, um, Julia, let me ask you a question. And you think about the environment we're currently in. And no doubt the last seven months for many of us have been challenging. And I think about at the same time, there's been some positives. I'm curious in your own life right now, just talk about some of the positive things that have happened over, for you personally over the last few months. Well, gosh, I think, you know, first and foremost, it's the found time with family. I mean, this has been such a, an exceptionally unique time. I have two daughters, eight and 12, and a husband who I co-founded Eventbrite with. So we've been in the trenches together nonstop for the last seven months. And I think that, you know, I, I, myself on having family dinner most nights pre-COVID, but I had no idea what I was missing out on in those little in-between moments. And that is time that I'm always going to cherish. And then on the business side, I think this, you know, in great sort of unheralded disasters and crises come great innovation and acceleration of opportunity. And that's what we found at Eventbrite. In a time when, you know, our mission has been incredibly tested, we've we realize that our mission endures beyond pandemics and that humans are dying to get back together again. And so we found just a really big opportunity to ask ourselves, what could we do with this, you know, with this moment in time? What would we do if we could do it all over again and really focus ourselves toward a much leaner, faster growing company that's so connected to what our core customer needs, which is the event creator building their small business and getting back on their feet. So I'm motivated. I mean, I, I feel like you, Ryan, I could jump out of bed in the morning and go, woo. I like that. Give me that woo again. I like woo! it. There it is. <laughs> I, I, one of the things that's also really interesting about, about you, Julia, and one of the things I've respected is, and I talked about it in the intro a little bit, about creating culture. And it was interesting as I was doing some research, you have a favorite book um, by uh, Priya Parker, the book about the art of gathering and this idea of coming together and um, communion. And I think about obviously what you're doing with your firm. Talk a little bit about what that book means to you and this idea of gathering and some of the takeaways from that book. Sure, well, Priya Parker wrote this book, The Art of Gathering, and I think she does such a great job of, um, of creating leadership lessons through the art of gathering people around events. And she talks about the fact that we all love to be in person together, but that there isn't a whole lot of pre-thought that goes into to gathering others. My favorite part about this book is when she says that being chill is cool, except when you're the host. And she says that you have to have the opportunity as, or have the authority rather as a host as your responsibility. So when you're thinking about gathering people like you did today, there has to be a purpose. You have to embody that conviction and that commitment and you have to lead. And I think it's just such a great leadership lesson because you have to go all in when you're creating a memorable event or experience or gathering and you have to take that leadership position. You have to take the reins as the host. So that's my favorite part of the book that I think applies to many people on this on this call. Um, and you know, I think the other thing is that sometimes things don't go according to plan, like how we've lost Cedric in the interwebs. <laughs> no doubt, and definitely have to be able to be flexible. And look, boom, there he is, there he is. Cedric, you like making me sweat. Shut down the internet whenever I show up on something, man. I, I love That's it, me. I love it. It's a regular Kylie Jenner. 
You know, and I wasn't gonna I wasn't gonna ask this question because I thought it might be too personal. But since, you were, since you were late, you know, I'm gonna go ahead and get in there and, and ask this question because I, I I did some research, said, and I asked around, asked some of your closest friends, tell me a little something about said that most people wouldn't know. And word on the street is you're a mama's boy, and I would never expect to hear that about Cedric the Entertainer. Are you a mama's boy? Let's put this on the record. Let's go. Hey, it, it, that's official though, yo. But I was I was raised in a single parent household where my mother who was a school teacher, uh, raised my sister and myself. She was dynamic. And of course that makes me a mama's boy, man. We we lived uh we lived from a little small town in Carruthersville, Missouri, where you know, with my mom and my grandmother. And then we moved to St. Louis and, and it was just us. So my mother and my sister, and myself. And so I had to hold it down, man. I had to be the man of the house. And that, that that makes me, yeah, makes me a mama's boy. I'm proud too. It's all right. Proud. Okay. I'm I'm yeah. a claim. I'm a mama's boy too. And I know my mom's one of the only individuals out there watching. Mom, I love you. I see you out there. So, uh, I understand. Said, give mom some love, especially yeah. single a single mom raising two two little ones. Never an easy task. So, I know that uh, we had some fans out there from St. Louis as well, and you're proud. Proud, proud from St. Louis uh, alumni and, and grew up there. Think about some of the things that you experienced growing up and take us back to that moment, said, whether it was in college or maybe even younger, where the light bulb went off and you said, you know what, I'm a little different. My dreams and my ambitions are a little bit different. And take us back to that moment when you said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get out of this area and I'm going to try to pursue this career in acting. I'm just curious, when was that time? And, and talk us through with that, how, how you got the courage to even have that dream. You know, uh, probably, you know, again, growing up in the Midwest, growing up in a small town, most people had aspirations to play sports and be an athlete. And so I was a pretty good, um, you know, what I call sandlot player, right? I can play at the park, I play basketball, football. But when I went to go play organized sports, I was not really ready for prime time. And it was something that you become quite aware of. But, you know, again, I had that this, this, this kind of inner desire to uh, perform, put on a show. So, uh, you know, I was encouraged to join the, the, the theater department and did my first play. And in this play, I had a small role, but I came out and people just loved what I did with the character. And that's when the lights hit you. That's when it hit you. Even though the role was small, I just kind of make, I milked it like each and every time I played a farmer. I don't even remember what the play was, but I just remember I was a farmer and I had on some overalls and I came out and I just added one little thing that people loved and I just couldn't wait to do it. And so after that, I just, you know, just kind of found that light, you know, kind of moved towards entertaining people. I always could, you know, sing and dance and those kind of things. And so, I became more more empowered to believe that I can do it. You know, once I decided that you know, kind of sports was was in my direction into uh, you know the world of fame and, and cash. It was always about money. <laughs> At the end of the day, that's you got to follow the paper trail. And thinking about the paper trail, Julia, last year your company had a chance to go public, um, which was a huge accomplishment and a testament. And obviously over 15 years, I know you started the company when you were only 15 years old, but you know, you, you think about what you and your, and your husband accomplished in that 15 years. I wanna know, take us back as well to that moment where you got the light bulb and the courage to say, you know what, we're gonna go build this company. And this company is gonna not just be this little dinky little startup, but we're actually gonna do something and scale it up to the point of where it is today. Well, I, I you know, I won the jack pot with who I chose to spend my life with. So I, you know, and it, and I, like that happens sometimes, sometimes it doesn't, but it happened to me in that I found someone who has an insatiable appetite for learning, believes that I can do anything and also is missing the chip that I think many serial entrepreneurs are missing that like says warning this may not work out <laughs> so there's this there's this insatiable optimism that's always following him around and so um, my husband Kevin and I started Eventbrite in 2006 and it was really small I mean everything starts small you know I think we spend a lot of time talking about the rocket ships and the big companies and we forget 
that everything has to start small. So, you know, as a, as a, um, not only a serial investor, but a prolific angel or sorry, sorry, serial entrepreneur, but prolific angel investor. And you yourself, Ryan, you know, that, you know, every single idea starts as just that. And we just started with the passion of, you know, for me, Coming from the background I came from when we started Eventbrite, I had an early career in television development and, you know, had spent about, I don't know, six years total working in, in cable network. And, you know, I, I loved um, really the part of it where we evoked emotion through the content that we were, that we were producing. And when I was, at, I was at MTV and I worked on Jackass, which was such a kick at, you know, 20 years old. And then I moved on to um, FX Networks. And I mean, you know, king among kings in terms of content creation. But I also was this lowly junior executive. So they put me on all the sort of less desirable projects. And I'll never forget that I was sent out to go um, research fandoms and all of these comic cons and these crazy events where people who are so passionate about something so obscure get together. And the energy was insane at these events. And we never made the, the show, but I always remembered that energy and that emotion. And so that followed me to this journey when, you know, Kevin coming from his background of a seed investor in PayPal and then starting a company called Zoom, X-O-O-M, uh, of, you know, international money transfer for immigrants to send money back to their families in less than $200 increments, better, faster, cheaper. He was really passionate about democratizing industries. So we put those two things together. We got together with our third co-founder, Renault, who was a, not only an engineer, but a passionate photographer who wanted to help people turn passions into profit. And that's how Eventbrite was born. And it was just the three of us in a windowless conference room in a warehouse in Potrero Hill um, with a wall full of cup of noodles. And we bootstrapped the company. And we spent less than a quarter of a million dollars in the first two years to get to basically a place where we were break even and, and operating on our profits. Then we went and raised money. And of course, you know, we, we just invested insanely in the business. But I think that like those early days are really important for people to remember that it's scrappy, it's small, and it's resting on your own DNA and your passion. Yeah, those, those early days are extremely important. And I'm always reminded as an athlete, sometimes as you go on in your career, what it was like to be a rookie and never to forget that moment and to continue to carry that with you. And Cedric, I, I think about your career and obviously all the things that you've accomplished and the butterflies that you get, that you got early on. And, and then the ability to see, um, to see the reaction that people had to your performance and how that became a drug. I'm curious now in your career, do you still get those same butterflies? Do you still get those same excite, that same excitement when you go into the row, you, you, you uh, into a, an audition, you and I were just talking earlier today and you just were, you know, you had a reading for your show and you guys are rehearsing. I'm just curious, do you still get that same level of excitement and how do you continue to hone your own craft at this point in your career? Yeah, I, I, I do to a degree. I mean, of course, by doing something over and over again, there is a level of comfortability that you get. Um, but uh, I just want to bring up something Julia said there, which is really great, man, is that I, I tell my kids this often, is that you can never be afraid to be the rookie, you know, in any situation, no matter how you've grown as a business, anytime you start something new, trust that being a rookie is where you, is how you really build the idea. And so a lot of times, you know, kind of even in to your question, a lot of times once you have success, you believe that success means that you're successful in any and everything. I literally can walk in being a great entertainer and become a great investor. It's not how it works. Like I have to be the rookie, you know, I have to, you know, and I've learned a lot from you. And so I try to encourage people, you know, other, uh, other young people that I try to get in to come in and, and be a part of this world. It's like, look, man, we've all kind of learned the same steps the same way. And now you're going to be a rookie in a different place and you're going to have to learn and listen. And, and though you may be successful in this one platform, you're not going to be the guy that's the lead guy over here, but it's okay. Because if you go through the process, one day you will be able to give the advice. And so, you know, I think that I still take that when I go and perform, I don't take it for granted. 
that, you know, that people just because I've, you know, been doing it for 30 years that people are supposed to laugh. I believe that they spend their money and it's my job to make sure that they get a value for that. So I do get butterflies because I do have to, I have to go out there and make sure that I'm there to deliver. I don't take it for granted. So uh, yeah, it is a little bit of a butterfly. It's not the same as when I first started for sure. You know, it, it, it's not that, but it is moments of, you know, trepidation and, and do I know, do I have all my transitions in my head right? And, and am I just gonna be free when I get out there and, you know, let whatever, you know, my other anxieties or things that I've been doing early today, let that go. I can't be mad that the bus driver got lost on the way here or the limo driver had his kid in the car. I don't know. That, that's yeah, I, didn't know you were I didn't know you were taking the bus to work anymore. I thought that you were passing. I mean the tour bus, the tour bus, man. The tour bus. <laughs> yeah. The two of us. I'm, yeah, yeah, that, you know, when I say bus driver, it has a bed and TVs. No. <laughs> no. I love it. I think, Sid, one of the things that I've always respected about you, and I think you alluded to it a little bit, this idea of reminding your kids about always being a rookie. But you always have had this amazing ability of, of being self-aware and really grounded. And again, I've talked to a number of your friends prior to this, trying to pick their brains on what would you say to Sid or what, would you, what compliments would you give? And universally, across the board, everybody said, you're the most down to earth superstar that they know. An individual that can just one of the guys. I'm curious, where does that come from? Where do you pull that from? And again, it's easy and we're around a lot of these individuals. Either, and Julie, you know this too, CEOs and others, people that have elevated to a certain level in their careers, their head starts to get pretty big. But yet you've been able to keep a certain sense of self and a family man and just one of the guys. Where, do you, where does that come from, Seth? You know, I, I, you know, I liken it to, again, I, I attribute it to my mother, man. My mother used to tell me one of, I thought her best advice was, uh, she was, she described it as good credit, but she basically says, your name walks into a room before you do and after you leave. So basically, if someone says your name, they're going to have an opinion about that as soon as they hear it. So what do you want that to be? Like, do you want that to be where everybody's in fear or do you want people to think and say good things about you so i've always kind of basically and, and and not in the sense that you want to be loved by everybody but the idea is that you want the spirit of who you are to be something that people find joyous when they think about you when they hear your name so whether you're there or not you you expect people to speak highly of you and so i i usually take that spirit into everything so i try to make sure that i'm paying attention to others that I want, you know, that I, I want from other people what I'm willing to give. And so I'd usually approach almost everything the same way. And that, that's, that's, I believe it, I attribute that to the attitude and, you know, that the, the amount of goodwill that I, that I kind of live with on a daily basis. So I remember somebody was asking me one time, like, cause I, I didn't walk in, you know, it was all these other comics that were coming into a room and everybody had security and people with everybody was like, yo, Sid, where your security at? And I was like, I don't, I don't know. You want to do it? Like, I was like, dude, I walk in the room with love, man. I don't, I just have no, I don't really see myself having enemies like that. I mean, I don't know. So I don't try to, I don't bring that to me. I try to throw it out where if you're gonna see me, even the hardest dude in the room is gonna be like, that's my guy right there. What's up, Sid? And that's what I expect. Uh, I love it. And I, uh, again, uh, well, I appreciate it. And, and definitely a tremendous amount of respect for the way that you carry yourself and you think through, how you think through that um, on a daily basis. And, and Julia, when you think about being a CEO and I think about all the CEOs and founders are, that are watching, which is most of the audience, I think about at times how lonely that position can be. Most people don't understand that it is a, a lonely position. And one of the things we talk about at Next Play is this idea of, the, of your starting five and having these individuals that you can get around, who are your, who's in your corner, who you're starting five. And once you kind of get a sense of who somebody's starting five is, you can kind of get a sense of how they may think or how they may operate. I'm curious, and you know, I know you obviously have Kevin in your corner because he's your co-founder and your life partner and your husband. But outside of Kevin, who's in your starting five and how do you manage um, the pressure that comes along with being somewhat lonely at the top. Uh, well, you know, I think that in, in my starting five, I am obviously so lucky to have somebody who not only has had my, my job at this company, but also is a co-founder in this company. And so 
you know, especially going through the COVID crisis, which is one of the biggest crises a you know business can ever face. Uh, that was just reinforced the value of having that partner. The second is my mom. You know, I'm a total mom's girl, so I, I fit in with this with this group. I mean, my mom is someone who I think, you know, is so so supportive. But I just live to make her proud, and that, and I'm like a never ending pursuit of that. So that keeps me going. Um, my daughter Emma, who's uh, 12, going on 13, and um, turns out a huge Cedric fan. So actually she never gets impressed by anything I do. And today she was absolutely dying. Um, so she is just like this, she's like sort of the best of me. So even today I had a problem and I just started talking to her about it and she's just such a good listener. So yay for, for you know, spawning good listening. Um, Ryan, you're part of my starting five because you and the rest of the two legit to quit Henry Crown class are just people that I feel like I can call anytime. Um, and I think that that sense of, of loyalty and unconditional love is so rare, especially in people who haven't known you your whole life. Um, and then finally, our, our first investor, Rula at Sequoia Capital is an incredible sounding board to me and someone who has been you know, at our side, the hearts side for almost two decades between Zoom and Eventbrite. So those are, you know, people that you feel like are just in your corner for all the right reasons. Um, and I wanted to pity you back on what Cedric said, because I think it's such a unique attribute, especially as a celebrity to have that sense of self in a space with others, because I think it's really easy like in our society, we just do a lot of really weird things to people who we deem famous, right? And I'll never forget my, a, a famous person who was my business idol. I went to their house and I was so excited to meet this person. And the person was just having a bad day, but it was a horrible interaction. And that for me, this was years ago, it just solidified in me the fact that if I ever was in a situation where somebody was excited to meet me or in any public situation that I would always be, I would always remember that moment, how heartbroken I was <laughs> that they weren't kind in that moment, that they didn't choose kindness or they didn't, you know, they weren't really, and I, and it's probably not fair to put that pressure on people. And I'm sure you feel that said, like, why are you supposed to be happy all the time? But it's like that person's one moment. And so I don't know. I, I take that pretty seriously. It, it guides me and helps me remain cheerful all the time. <laughs> Said, I think about when, when you, when you started uh, your first role and some people credit this as your first role was a cowardly lion on the whiz and on theater at the Apollo on the Apollo theater. And that was one of your first big roles. And now fast forward where you are, what's changed in your industry that you're proud of? And what, what, what's changed that you're not, not a fan? Well, I think probably the thing that's probably changed the most and has in the, been the last few years is that you start to see a lot more um, creatives, both, you know, with the writing side and producing, like I produce my show. Uh, I produce several other shows as well. And like my video show I do. And then you have like, you know, Ava DuVernay's and Lena Waifs and, and Kenya Burris's and, and, you know, uh, you know, so many talented people, Jordan Peele's, just a lot of people really being able to express their ideas. And that's been great because we were able to see our images and tell our stories from a point of view that, that you know, that pen leads first. Uh, but when it comes to the executive side of the business, when it comes to the, the business side, the, the uh, decision makings, the, the actual uh, corporate entities, that that part is still very very you know slow and sluggish and hasn't quite caught up to speed. So that's where I feel um, you know where it becomes very important. And, and you see that more and more when you have the social unrest that we have now. Even when it comes down to it, that one one hand really washes the other. People don't know that, but when you see uh, the you get the idea that all all kids who wear do rags or and all young kids got on tattoos in order even in order even in order to describe uh, a person you 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 put this image out there like oh he's a thug and you know it just sends the wrong message and i think you know 
it's hard to fight that both uh, on, the, on the music business and in television and film. And so we just really, you know, really uh, continue to push uh, ad advocacy in that area. That's what a lot of, you know, uh, my contemporaries do and myself and my friends, those, those are the kind of things that we want to push forward. And we believe more than anything is, you know, capital, having our say so, being able to show up with, with our own ideas, our own platforms, money, things behind us that says, all right, we're not falling into those fame, same four or five or, or six systems. We might have lost you. Bad signal. Julia, I, I that's an awesome freeze, by the way. Can it we? It is. Just it's usually not making that. a pretty ugly face when I get frozen. So he, 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 that's pretty, pretty solid. But <laughs> when I think about one of the things that you also do, a lot of people don't know this about you, and, and they know all the things you do on the external for your creators, and obviously the platform that you've developed. Uh, with your company to support them. But one of the things you also do personally, you have a passion and a heart and you're trying to build a foundation around helping your creators and helping events that may have been impacted negatively by a, a catastrophe or an event, being able to help have them have the right resources to bring them back up to speed. Talk a little bit about that mission and desire that you have to help those individuals. Yeah, well, I, you know, at Eventbrite, our mission is to bring the world together through live experiences. And the way in which we envision doing that is by enabling event creators to be successful. And how we win at our strategy is being their trusted choice. You know, there are many platforms out there that you can use to gather people and sell tickets, but no platform is as intuitive and self-service as Eventbrite. And we've been focusing maniacally around event creators in the mid-market space for 14 years. So we've really built a deep relationship with them. In 2019, almost a million event creators hosted over 4.7 million events that gathered 300 million people. That was all over the globe. And as you know, there's a lot of high risk. I mean, it seems sort of cliche now to even say it because of COVID, but even pre-COVID, there were a lot of risks in being that bearer of responsibility to bring that experience to life, be it a natural disaster. Um, so many things can be disrupted to a live experience. And so we've really focused on giving event creators the tools that they need and the support they need in order to keep their business going, in order to, to stay afloat. Because when something bad happens and an event gets canceled, no one's really looking out for the person whose back that event was on, right? And so that inspiration has driven us to really focus on what are the ways in which we can help event creators be able to stand on their own two feet. And never has that been more important than now, right? So our fellow, you know, uh, too legit to quit, uh, you know, Henry Crown mate, uh, Dana is really, I think, exemplifying this through the Save Our Stages initiative um, and, you know, bringing to light the specific hardships that venues are facing right now. These independent venues are the ones that are bringing us the next big acts, the next big superstars. And without these stages, we are not going to have that opportunity to see those people in small, intimate settings before they become superstars playing stadiums and arenas. So if you guys haven't checked it out, it's called Save Our Stages. That's the national campaign that they're running right now in order to help venues stay open. Yeah, I think most of us have some story or some moment in time when we were younger where we were at one of those venues, at one of those independent locations and got a chance to see the big first big star and we can all talk about that and so awesome what Dana's doing. So I'm glad you gave her some love. One of the other things I think that's unique that you've also been able to do and you, you and I have had conversations about this. This has been a tough time obviously for Eventbrite as well. But one of the things I've appreciated about you as a leader is you talked about your team and you talk about how proud you are of the team and how committed they are to constantly working, constantly showing up because they're showing up for your creators. And that this community of people that you, that you have both externally and internally is really powerful. Talk about in this environment, we're all working from home and working through these different mediums now, how you've been able to maintain culture and be able to keep that core nucleus that you're so proud of that's working at a member. Well, you know, I'll say that it's, it's hard when you have a culture where everybody really likes each other because we 
thrive off being around one another. And I think one, one of the unique attributes of Eventbrite is that being in the office is fun. It's dynamic. It's, dare I say, an experience. Um, you know, but I think we have such a strong culture because we look out for one another, because we're not just in this to, you know, make money. We're in this to build a great company and to win together. And so um, going to a fully remote work environment, which we did in early March, you know, being the tip of the spear is a little, has some, has some advantages. Uh, we saw immediately how big COVID would be, you know, to our own business. And we also knew we needed to move quickly to get everybody used to working from home. Um, it hasn't been as bad as I think I maybe thought it would be because we have this strong bond and this underlying cultural foundation. So I think it's just really important to always be thinking about you know, it's not just about when the going gets good or recruiting great talent. It's about, it's a very much about when the going goes bad and worst case scenarios do happen. And you want to have that team bond and dynamic because this team just rolled up their sleeves and didn't take one second to feel sorry for themselves, just jumped right in. And it's, it's taken me until now to really be able to uh, even think back to those days because they were so dramatic and, and, you know, that, that, that experience is so unique. Um, but one of the things I think we've done is in, in reflecting back and appreciating all that, we just upped our communication by a factor of like three. So everything we do now is far more consistent or far more frequent than it was before. I have an all camp company meeting twice a, twice a week. I used wow. to only do that once every other week. I have um, stand-ups with my executive team, one on Monday morning, one on Friday afternoon, and then a, a meeting in the middle on Wednesday. So I think just that seems really simple, but and sometimes it can seem arduous, but during the crisis, we were talking multiple times a day as a full executive team, and then you know twice a week as a board. Like These are things that I think just simple communication and the cadence and frequency can really help when you're not all in the same place, You know, feeding off each other's energy and having those side conversations. Absolutely. I think that's been something, a, a, key, a key ingredient that most companies have adopted during this time is increasing their, their, their communication and finding a way to make sure it's also efficient, right? And being able to optimize time. So um, I appreciated you saying that because I'm sure a lot of the CEOs are trying to figure out how to navigate these waters. And I think, Cedric, one of the things that I'm, I was thinking about as well is as you disappeared once again, and you, I love this disappearing act and reappearing. Like, like a genie. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no idea what's going on with our Wi-Fi here. It's something crazy happening. And I, I, I'll, uh, I'll send you some money, pay that Wi-Fi bill. You know, I got you, man. I got you. Thank you, man. Thank you, brother. Uh, one of the things you also have, uh, you have a heart for others. And I think about your foundation. And I think about the things that you do with that foundation and you reaching out and giving back. And what does the power of giving mean to you? Well, I mean, one, I think that, of course, whenever you can do something for others, I believe that energy just comes right back to you. I mean, people talk about karma. Usually they use it in a negative way, like, oh, that's that's just karma coming back at you. But yeah, I, I would say karma also works to your advantage. If you do great things for people, uh, then that energy comes back. And so uh, through our scholarship programs, also through... Um, you know, the hospital, uh, women's health pavilion I have in my mother's name in St. Louis, uh, along with, of course, so many things from diabetes to, uh, you know, boys and girls clubs, all these things that, you know, that kind of directly affect um, in and around my family. These are things that I'll jump right in on. Uh, we've just been doing great work and have an opportunity to, to see uh, how we change people's lives. And so, uh, been, you know, we often get letters from kids who went to school on our scholarships. Uh, you know, my sister, who was an educator at Pepperdine University, we love that. We love to, you know, find kids that are, you know, years later, they're like, yo, my, you know, I, I got one of your scholarships and now, you know, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And, you know, it, it, it's just one of those things that, you know, it makes you feel great. And I think that, you know, like for most of us, when you have an opportunity to do something good for others, uh, that's the reason you do it. You don't really expect the accolades. You know, you know, I would say you loan some money to some family members. You never really expect to get it back. So, you know, that's how I feel when I'm trying to do charity work. I'm not expecting this to come back to me. I'm doing it because I feel like it's going to do you some good. Uh, even though I tell the kids I give scholarships to, it's a loan. 
I'm like, look, I'm gonna find you at some point in time and want my money back. You know, so. Uh, I, I respect that. And I think about how important, all, again, Julie, I know you have a heart for others as well and said, I, I appreciate that all the things you do for, for those students. I think one of the things that's really interesting, you talk about not expecting to have anything back, but you, know, you think about where you came from, where you grew up and last year, getting a chance to have your star put on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Just talk about what that moment meant to you. That was a legacy moment, and to be able to be acknowledged and respected for your body of work, um, pretty pretty special. What did that moment mean for you, and how did you feel during that time? Yeah, you know, of course you think about those kind of things. When I first got to St. Uh, came from St. Louis to Los Angeles, I lived a block over from the Hollywood Walk of Fame Street, and I would walk up there for food and, you know, the stores and restaurants. And you would see these great names on there. I mean, from Richard Pryor to Lucille Ball to, you know, just great, great superstars, you know, that you would see their names on this street. And, you know, I'm young. I'm just coming to, to, to the city, never really thinking about that as a real thing. Like you see it and you recognize those people, you see them as iconic and you never even see yourself in that same category. So, you know, that moment, you know, and to have, you know, someone like Magic Johnson come out and my good friend George Lopez and so many wonderful supporters uh, around the industry to show up to be able to be there for me on that day was, um, it was really special, you know, to, to, to know that, um, that that was actually happening, man, to, you know, to, to, to look down there and go by. And I'll go by from time to time. I'm not like crazy, like a, like a crazy person, but you know, just in case, you know, the dude in the Batman suit is not treating my star with respect, you know, I'm like, bruh, you know, you know, go over there and stand on, stand on Alfonso Rivera's star. I don't know. <laughs> clean it up a little bit. Yeah, huh? yeah, I'll clean it up. Don't put any gum on my star. I'm like making sure we're cleaning that up. That did happen like early on. Someone had like put some gum and people had walked on my star and uh, somebody sent me a picture. I called the commission that day was like, hey, get take care yeah. of that. Yeah, clean that up. Get, that, get the scraper out, buddy. That's not, that's a no a mask brainer. for your star. Yeah, oh, that would be nice now. Like, I put a mask on there. <laughs> so I think about where we are in the time, and obviously there's plenty of more questions for us to, to ask and a lot more questions that I have, but I think we should take a couple of the audience questions. And, and Meta World Peace, Meta, good to see you out there. Uh, as, as a question for Julia, as a fairly new founder himself, at what point did you start giving your investors veto rights? Never. <laughs> Never. And it was there a reason why, what, why can you keep the control? What was the reason behind that? I just think it's really important that founders, you know, if you can to, to really, um, you know, there's only, there's only a certain number of people building the company and waking up every day, you know, thinking, eating, breathing, starving often. Like it, it'd be like if Cedric, um, as you were coming up in your career, you gave everybody rights to what you would be, you know, doing like the decisions of what you'd be doing or where you'd be investing your time. So I don't think it's a bad thing to have investors who are influential, but I definitely don't think founders should give veto rights. Um, we've had a board out of Emprite. We have had rather the benefit of some prolific investors from Lee Fixel, Roloff Botha, Henry Ellen Bogan. I mean, these are, these are people who have helped guide companies to billions of billions of dollars in valuation. And, you know, when you get a call from the, those people, you listen and, you know, you learn, but, you know, you, you got to make your own decisions and stand on your own two feet. And I just don't think any, I think when you get to a place where you have to hand over veto rights for capital, you really need to ask yourself, do, do you need to be taking that capital or can you build, you know, manifest your own destiny and build profitability? I know I'm speaking to investors, but I know you all are looking, are focused on building the next best companies. And those are the ones that are able to stand on their own two feet, frankly. So, um, so I guess that, that if I'm understanding the, the answer, there was a question, that would be my answer. I appreciate that insight. And, and Cedric, a mutual friend of ours, Prakash, over at Nextdoor, one of the co-founders of Nextdoor, sent in a question. 
He said, what, what initially drew you to technology and this community? And what are some of your goals, both from an investor and an entrepreneur right now? Maybe what are some of the things you're working on? Well, you know, I, I think well, what initially drew me is that you started to see, of course, in the, in, you know, maybe for, for, you know, outside people, the last 10 years or so of seeing like companies just really pop and go. And, you know, from, you know, from the, the Instagrams to, you know, Twitter and, and you know, from that era. And, and of course, once something like Uber came into play, something that, you know, we all kind of realized like, man, that, that's such a unique idea, even though it's not, it's something so usable that we were like, okay, I, you started to understand that the world is really connected by our phones. We're connected by the ability of convenience. And you start to understand like, these are gonna be great places to, uh, you know, one, find well, find great ideas, and but also really help people because that's what they're using. Um, and, you know, and I think that that's helped me grow a lot. You know, I, I'm involved in a couple of different companies, you know, one, from, some from the ground up. And, you know, most of them are, uh, you know, one is a big data, you know, it's about the data, it's about getting information, you know, and, and, and we realized that started to be even more so the key. Um, when you told me I was going to be on with Julia, I thought this was great because during the COVID, I started another little company it was all about um, called Fan Room. It's all about uh, us guys who used to can go and, and have a meet and greet and meet your fans and talk to them and come backstage. And now we don't see them at all. And so this was a great opportunity for us to use that. And we use Eventbrite to do the ticketing. And it just ended up being, you know, a very cool little company where you can say, hey, guys, I, you know, I'm not in Pittsburgh, but, you know, jump on and say hello. <clears throat> and, and so uh, it's been great. And, and again, you realize that technology is allowing us to stay connected and, uh, and an opportunity to also build a great company. So, and so, um, and, you know, that's what really draw me in. And, and, uh, and of course, uh, you know, Kosh is great. You know, we, we met, I came there and he's so super cool. And, you know, and of course his, his, his app is killing it. I mean, I, 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 I know more of my neighbors than I would have never met. You never even meet people. <laughs> like, you don't know your neighbors anymore, but on here, like, I'm like, oh, that's the people with the dogs. And I seen them walking. Okay, got it. You, like, you don't know your neighbors because you drive through three gates to get to your main house. Well, okay. well, settle down now. I told you, you I, don't have, I don't have security, <laughs> but I do have gates. <laughs> Julia, one of the, another question came from our audience. Obviously, your title comes with a lot of responsibility and comes with a lot of sacrifices. What, what, sorry, what, uh, what do you think are some of the things that you wish you didn't have to sacrifice and do you believe in work-life balance? No, I, I, I do believe in balance. I think that there's, there's, you know, oftentimes life feels like a jigsaw puzzle and one piece is missing under the couch. So I never quite get used to the feeling of, I got this. I'm a great mom and I'm a great CEO. That doesn't often happen. And when it does, it's super fleeting. So I've at least gotten used to the ephemeral nature of balance and that it'll come back. It's a pendulum that swings. But, you know, I think whether or not you're a female CEO, a male CEO, you're constantly trying to trade off priorities. And so what I've become really, I think, pretty good at, I would call myself an emerging black belt of um, time resource allocation, because I think time is the, I know that time is the only thing you can't buy. So, you know, it's a, it's a great luxury, but you can really invest in yourself and you can learn to outsource your non-core competencies. And that's not always, um, you know, hiring staff. That's, that's figuring out how you can hyper prioritize your time to be spent on the highest output activities um, and things that make you happy and then figuring out how to offload the other stuff through technology or taking a break. I think everybody understands if you're a founder that you're not going to be able to do everything, you know, at, at the same place when you're not building a company. Um, and I think that the, you know, I, I don't know, my journey was, I have like, I wasn't supposed to be here. Right. Like, and, and actually the person that, that led me to this place, was someone I've never met and they worked at the financial aid department at Pepperdine University. So I was just thinking about that said when you when you mentioned it because 
I got into Pepperdine as my first choice school, early admission, and couldn't afford to go. And so I was going to... I was going to go to a different college. And my mom said, you know, why don't you just write a letter? And I'm like, oh, mom, please, come on. They're not going to read my letter. And so I wrote a letter and I explained why I wanted to go to Pepperdine. I wanted to be in television. I thought broadcasting, but thankfully I went to the behind the camera after the first semester. Um, and, and somebody read that letter. And I still don't know who it is. Of course, when I got there, I didn't even think to go check. I wish I would have, but somebody read my letter and somebody put a financial aid package in the mail to me that changed my entire life. Um, and see, Cedric got it bored of my story. So <laughs> but I think, I think the point is like, you never know where you're going to get that opportunity. And then it leads you to this place. So I don't think about it as sacrifices. And I don't think anyone should think about it as a sacrifice to be a founder of your own company and a CEO of something you feel passionate about. Um, at least that's what I, I tell myself on days like this, where I'm just like, oh, <laughs> you know. I, yeah, I, and the Pepperdine story, I knew you, there's a number of things that you guys have connections with. And obviously, um, Cedric was talk, talked about his startup that he's, uh, he's excited about and that uses your technology to help uh, invite people into, into his fandom, into his little, into his rooms with his fans. So we'll have to find a way to connect you guys after the show. One of the other questions uh, from Mike in the audience, uh, Julia, this is, I'll, I'll send this your way. Who are your mentors and, and who's helped you in your career? Who, maybe who's want somebody that took a chance on you early on? Well, I think, you know, my philosophy is to surround, you know, surround yourself with really smart people who aren't going to just tell you what you want to hear. And so I'm constantly looking for, for people like that in my life, whether it's people I'm just meeting or people I've known for, for decades. So I wouldn't say that I have one mentor beyond obviously Kevin. Um, you know, it's really, it's, it's, it's great to be able to live with your mentor. Um, but I think it's mostly about finding the right people to ask questions for problems you want to solve. I think mentorship is a really incredible idea. Sometimes it can feel very heady because it feels like a big responsibility. But rather I find that if I call somebody for a certain question, and especially during the COVID crisis, I called a bunch of people. And um, I'll never forget, I talked to Bob Mylod, who was the CFO at Priceline during the 9-11 crisis. And I said, you know, what, what should I expect here? This feels like uh, this big of a crisis. And he said, expect to be generating more, more refunds than revenue soon. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, and, and sure enough, within 10 days of talking to him, we were generating more refunds than revenue as the entire event industry wow. came to a halt. So I'll never forget that, that conversation with him. Um, and I bet he doesn't even know that he's a mentor of mine, right? But it was, it was transformational because it, it gave me a, a moment to prepare for that. Yeah, and, and definitely a moment you're never going to forget. And, and obviously, you guys have responded well um, as you guys push through this. Um, and, and Cedric, I think about for you and and where you are now. We're getting we're getting up on uh, on the end of time here, so this has been exciting. And thank you both once again for all that you've given us. You know, one of the things a lot of our CEOs continue to ask us is this idea of being able to tell a compelling story. One of the roles that you have as a leader is both to tell your story like Julia does about the company and all the exciting things that it does, and then internally to convince people, especially in the early days, to come join you and to believe in the impossible. What would be some of your tips, Cedric, being from the, the storytelling world that would help individuals tell a more compelling story? What are some of the keys to telling a great story? I mean, well, one is you, got, you just got to lay the foundation of what it is that you're talking about. And that usually starts with something that is personal, something that, you know, why you are, you know, telling this story in the first place. Um, and then you, you have to, uh, you have to look for something that, it, you know, is, I would say that evokes emotion. Some, somehow you, you're looking to evoke some, do, some response that either says, I understand you, or wow, that's interesting. Something that, you know, you're trying to get to, of course, you want to lift them up. You want to find some stuff that, that, that becomes aspirational and encouraging and that says you, can, you too can be a part of this. It's so great. And, and then you, you want to close the deal. 
you want to say, hey, come be a part of this. Join me. I like that's, it. That's I like storytelling, it. man. You're gonna, get, you're gonna get pinged in your DM. A lot of people are gonna ask you to become a consultant and help them with their pitches. <laughs> um, and before we lose you again, I want to make sure we get this question in. I know that you may disappear here any moment. And so as we get ready to wrap up again, as we think about what Iron Sharpens Iron is all about is this idea of pursuing excellence and being around men and women that are great at what they do. But everybody has a different definition of greatness. And so Cedric, how would you define greatness? Oh, wow. I mean, I, I think it's those who take the time to um, build and look for uh, that 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 championship spirit that thing that says i want to win i am um, i'm going to win and and that i work hard to get it done i don't expect something for free i'm willing to do the work i'm willing to sacrifice the time i'm willing to sacrifice uh you know money if necessary and i'm, I'm gonna do that for the greater good of this idea of my family my team and others around me and i believe that that you know that exemplifies greatness. It, 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 it lets you know that you're, you're building something not for just yourself, but for all the people who are there fighting in the trenches with you. Julia, I'm gonna ask you the same question. Obviously, given what you've accomplished in your career and being a leader now of a phenomenal company, obviously there's this idea that you too are trying to pursue excellence and greatness in everything that you do and how you attack your days. How would you define greatness? I think there's a depth of excellence and greatness where that only comes from maniacal focus. But I think that that isn't enough. I think building, for instance, a great company means that you are developing great leaders, that people are thinking about your company as being their best job, that you're an industry leader, that you have fun. I mean, life is way too short. And then hopefully this period of reflection for us can improve that tenfold. Um, and we can take that forward, which it's like, it's, it's not worth doing if you're not having fun at some point. And, you know, you may define fun different ways and certainly it's not always fun, but you should really find that, that joy and be able to have fun. And, and I think that, that being to, able to look back at your career and see the people that you helped, you know, grow and cultivate great leaders, God, that, that will be the, that will be the cherry on top for me. Awesome. Well, thank you both for pursuing greatness and thank you both for joining us here at Iron Sharpens Iron. It means so much to me that you gave us your time, which is the most valuable resource you have. You shared it with us today. And thank you for everybody out there that joined us tonight. Uh, again, we hope to see you guys all in person soon enough. Um, continued uh, success. Be safe, stay healthy, and God bless. Thank you guys. Thank you. All right, thanks. I'll holler. <laughs> That was brutal.